Getting straight to it. An excerpt from Robin D. G. Kelly's Hammer and Ho, Communist in Alabama during the Great Depression, 1931. Cotton farmers are in the midst of a crisis at least a decade old. After World War I, cotton prices plummeted, forcing planters to reduce acreage despite rising debts. It is no coincidence, therefore, that black farmers straddling the line between tenancy and ownership form the nucleus of Alabama's communist-led rural movement. Within the limited world of cotton culture existed a variety of production relations. Cash tenants, more often white than black, usually lease land for several years at a time, supplied their own implements, strapped animals, seed, feed, fertilizers, farmed without supervision. Shared tenants, on the other hand, might own some draft animals and planting materials, but the landowner provided any additional equipment, shelter, and if necessary, advances of cash. Verbal contracts were made annually, and the landowner generally marketed the crop, giving the tenant between three-fourths to two-thirds of the price, minus any advances of previous debts. The most common form of tenancy in the South was sharecropping. Virtually propertyless workers paid with a portion of the crops raised. Sharecroppers had little choice but to cultivate cotton. The landowner's choice of staple crops. The system not only kept most tenants in debt, but it perpetuated living conditions that bordered on the intolerant. The gradations of tenancy must be understood in relation to both race and geographic distribution of cotton production. The black belt, the throne of king cotton in Alabama, still resembled its antebellum past in that blacks outnumbered the whites four to one in some counties in 1930. It is tempting to characterize the black belt as timeless, static, semi-feudal remnant of the post-reconstruction era, but some idyllic picture ignores the history of rural opposition and does not take into account significant structural changes that have occurred since the 1890s. Given the demography of the plantation, open collective rebellion was virtually impossible. Shacks were placed near the edge of the plantation in two or three miles often separated the tenant families from one another. Therefore, more individualized forms of resistance, theft, arson, sabotage, foot dragging, slander, and occasional outbreaks of personal violence were used effectively to wrest small material gains or retaliate against unfair landlords. With the onset of World War I, for example, large numbers of workers left the countryside altogether to take advantage of the employment opportunities in the sprawling urban centers in the north and south. Areas most affected by the exodus were forced to adopt limited forms of mechanization to make up for the dwindling labor force and rising wages. The movement off the land was accompanied by improved roads and availability of affordable automobiles, which increased rural mobility. But after 1929, cash was a rare commodity, and landowners resurrected the commissary system. By the time the Birmingham communists established links to the cotton belt in early 1931, tenancy seemed on the verge of collapse. Advances of food and cash were cut off, debts were piling higher, and the city offered fewer opportunities to escape rural poverty. Groups of black farmers now saw the logic in the Communist Party call for collective action. In January 1931, an uprising of some 500 sharecroppers in England, Arkansas, compelled Southern communists to take the rural poor more seriously. Birmingham Party leaders immediately issued a statement exhorting Alabama farmers to follow the Arkansas example. District leadership enthusiastically laid plans for the sharecroppers and farm workers union that would conceivably unite poor white farmers of northern Alabama with and black tenants and sharecroppers in the black belt. And the party's position on social equality and equal rights alienated most poor white farmers, and within a few months, the party's white contacts in Coleman and St. Clair counties had practically dissipated. The Coppers and the Farm Workers Union was eventually launched in, in Tallapoosa County. In 1930, almost 70% of those engaged in agriculture were either tenants or wage workers, the majority of whom were sharecroppers. Blacks comprised the bulk of the county's tenant and rural laboring populations and resided in the flat, fertile southeastern and southwestern sections of the county, as in the Black Belt counties further south, antebellum planter families in those two areas retained political and economic ascendancy, despite competition from textile and sawmill interests. Soon after the cotton had been planted and chopped, several landlords withdrew all cash and food advances in calculated effort to generate labor for the newly built Russell Sawmill. The mill paid exactly the same for unskilled labor as going rate for cotton chopping. 50 cents a day for men and 25 cents a day for women. By mid-May, the Southern Worker reported significant union gains in Tallapoosa County and announced that black sawmill workers and farmers in the vicinity have enthusiastically welcomed communist leadership. The nascent movement formulated seven basic demands, and the most crucial being the continuation of food advances. The right of sharecroppers to market their own crops was also a critical issue because landlords usually gave their tenants the year's lowest price for the cotton and held onto the bales until the prices increased, thus denying the producer the full benefits of the crop. Union leaders also demanded small gardens for resident wage hands, cash rather than wages in kind, a minimum wage of a dollar per day and a three-hour midday rest for all laborers, all of which were applied equally, irrespective of race, age, or sex. 
Camp Hill, Alabama became the scene of the Union's first major confrontation with the local power structure. On July 15th, Taft Holmes organized a group of sharecroppers near Camp Hill and invited several Union members to address the group in a vacant house that doubled as a church. And all about eight black men and women piled into the abandoned house to discuss the CFWU and the Scottsboro case. After a black informant notified Tallapoosa County Sheriff Kyle Young of the gathering, deputized vigilantes raided the meeting place, brutally beating men and women alike. The posse then regrouped at CFWU leader Tommy Gray's home and assaulted his entire family, including his wife who suffered a fractured skull. In an effort to obtain information about the CFWU, union organizer Jasper Kennedy was arrested for possessing 20 copies of the Southern Worker, and Holmes was picked up by a police the following day. Interrogated for several hours upon release, fled to Chattanooga. Despite the violence, about 150 sharecroppers met with Matt Code, an illiterate Birmingham steelworker originally from Charleston, South Carolina, who had to become the party's organizer in Tallapoosa. The following evening, the vacant house southwest of Camp Hill, when Sheriff Young arrived on the scene with Camp Hill Police Chief J.M. Wilson, and in Deputy A.J. Thompson, he found Ralph Gray, Tommy Gray's brother and CFWU organizer, standing guard about a quarter mile from the meeting. Gray and the sheriff traded harsh words and in the heat of the argument exchanged buckshot. Young, who received gunshot wounds to the stomach, was rushed to the hospital in nearby Alexander City. While Gray lay on the side of the road, his legs riddled with bullets. Fellow union members carried Gray to his home where the group, including Co, barricaded themselves inside the house. The group held off a posse led by Wilson long enough to allow most members to escape, but the wounded Ralph Gray opted to remain in his house until the end. The posse returned with reinforcements and found Gray lying in his bed, his family huddled in a corner. According to his brother, someone in the group poked a pistol in Brother Ralph's mouth and shot down his throat. The mob burned the home to the ground and dumped his body on the steps of the Dadeville Courthouse. The mangled and lifeless leader became an example of other black sharecroppers as groups of armed whites took turns shooting and kicking the body, kicking the bloody corpse of Ralph Gray. For the next few days, between 34 and 55 black men were arrested near Camp Hill, nine of whom were under 18 years of age. Most of the defendants were charged with conspiracy to murder or with carrying a concealed weapon, but five union members were charged with assault to murder. Although Police Chief Wilson could not legally act out his wish to kill every member of the Reds there and throw them in the creek, the Camp Hill Police Department stood idle as enraged white citizens waged genocidal attacks on the black community that left dozens wounded and or dead and forced entire families to seek refuge in the woods. Union Secretary Matt Code, the vigilante's prime target, fled all the way to Atlanta. Behind the violence in Tallapoosa County loomed the Scottsboro case, but unlike Scottsboro, the Camp Hill defendants were members of the party's organization, and there was no question as to who was going to defend them. After lawyers associated with the party secured the release of all but seven of the imprisoned sharecroppers, prominent Alabama citizens, wary of creating another Scottsboro episode, pressured the authorities to quietly drop the case. But union organizers found little romance in the bloodletting or the uprooting of hundreds of poor black farmers that followed the Camp Hill battle. Moreover, rural conditions in Tallapoosa County had not improved at all. By September, the height of the cotton picking season, landlords again promised to cut off all the food and cash advances after the cotton was picked. And many tenants had to pick cotton on other plantations in order to earn enough to survive the winter. The going rate at the time was a meager 30 cents per 100 pounds, a tidy sum considering the average laborer could only pick 200 pounds a day. The repression and the deteriorating economic conditions stunted the union's growth initially, but the lessons of Camp Hill also provided a stimulus to a new type of movement, reborn from the ashes of the old. The communist movement in Alabama resonated with the cultures and traditions of black working people, and yet at the same time it offered something fundamentally different. It proposed a new direction, a new kind of politics that required the self-activity of people usually dismissed as inarticulate. The sun had not set on the proud history of communists in Alabama. Black sharecroppers would continue to struggle.